Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Leon Collin Conference is not only the most important forum for international security in Norway, but also one of the most beautiful and charming international conferences in Europe. And I would like to begin by recalling one memory directly related to this conference but also to our current situation. Five years ago, the Norwegian Atlantic Committee held its annual Lincoln Security Conference. Its open session was organized in another venue, in the premises of the Norwegian Nobel Committee on the beautiful Henrik Ibsen Street in Oslo. There were important statements by ministers of defense of Finland, Norway, and Sweden, and a representative from the NATO headquarters. The chair of the board of the Norwegian Atlantic Committee, Madam Eriksson, in her opening remarks, recalled very pertinent words of the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. History is not written in advance. We can prevent an age of disorder if we have the will. And the title of the conference was Security in Northern Europe, after Crimea, Brexit, and the US elections. And then a representative of Ukraine took the floor and addressed the audience with the following comment, and I quote, taking into account the successes of the Nordic model, normally it is not correct to argue with the Scandinavians. Most of what they are saying or doing can be taken as an inspiring example to follow. But there is one important observation that has to be made in relation to the title of the conference. We may well live in a post-US election world. We may well live in a post-Brexit world. But we are still not living in a post-Crimean world. This page of history has not been written yet. Ukraine is still continuing its resistance to the Russian aggression, which is the aggression not only against our common values, but the very foundations on which these values are based. And Ukraine will continue this resistance. Ukrainians are not going to give up easily. We shall fight on the beaches. But of course now is the very moment when Ukraine needs more Nordic support, when Ukraine needs more and not less of the European support. And of course Ukraine needs more, not less of the transatlantic solidarity. As it was stated, history is not written in advance. We can prevent the words from coming if we have the will. It is very important that this should be duly reflected in the future decision-making process in Europe and beyond. End of quotation. Sadly, we didn't listen to the Ukrainians. We didn't succeed in gathering the will. And we didn't prevent the worst catastrophe in Europe since the end of the Second World War. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that at this dreadful hour of Europe, we Ukrainians have a special responsibility to find a delicate balance between remaining diplomatic and respectful, and yet saying everything clearly and convincingly enough in order to reach to the hearts and minds of all the Europeans, even the hearts and minds of some of the Ruslan Fersteh, who are still present in our societies, even after we have seen the terrible crimes of the Kremlin regime. We have to do this not because we want to find comfort in blaming someone for their fatal mistakes in the past, not because we want to engage into a we told you so exercise, but because sometimes we feel that even the current catastrophe at the very heart of Europe might not be convincing enough for us Europeans to draw the right conclusions and take the right decisions for our future. Many things will become clearer when my heroic country, with the support of its partners, wins this war for civilization, this battle for our common values, and repels the Russian invaders from its territory. But even now, in the middle of this terrible war, we have to start thinking about the most obvious lessons and our future decisions. In my short remarks, I will limit myself only to five such lessons that we in Ukraine deem to be of particular relevance and importance. 
And the lesson number one is, of course, that Ukraine must win. Ukraine's victory will be Europe's victory. Ukraine's victory will be the victory of freedom and human dignity over tyranny. It will be the triumph of right over might. The very essence of the European project demands the Ukraine's prevail. And understanding by Ukrainians of how their victory will look like is absolutely the same as it would be for any other European people in relation to their own country. It is a restoration of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. And then the reconstruction and modernization of the country. Ukrainians proved to be good warriors, but Ukrainians are also realistic. The Ukrainian people know what kind of enemy they are facing. They know that their hardest sacrifices and their toughest battles for their freedom and for the values of our civilizations are most likely still ahead. And we know it is the Ukrainians only who will have to stop the Russian invaders. There is this popular anecdote in response to the Kremlin's claims that they are fighting the entire NATO in Ukraine. A Russian intellectual asks a Russian general, what are our losses in our war with NATO in Ukraine so far? 30,000 soldiers killed and many more wounded, some 5,000 tanks and fighting vehicles, almost 400 military aircraft and helicopters, and several thousand pieces of other weaponry, replies the general. And what are NATO losses? NATO hasn't yet arrived there, says the general. Then Russia has really compelling reasons to be afraid of that horrific NATO, concludes the intellectual. We know perfectly well that there will be no other boots on the ground in Ukraine to repel Russia. Yet even this doesn't frighten and will not stop the Ukrainian people. But when someone says Russia should not be humiliated, and if the implication is that Ukraine's victory should be somehow limited in its scope, they are poised, they are poised to humiliate Russia even more. By launching this unprovoked war of aggression, the Kremlin himself imposed the most shameful disgrace on the Russian state in all five centuries of its known history. If someone wants to spare Russia and give it another chance for humiliation, they should be careful about what they wish for. Maybe this is an inconvenient truth, but we have to admit that the current brutality of Russia on the world scene is guided primarily by the Kremlin's conviction that Europe is weak and unprincipled, that its former leaders will continue to queue for jobs in Russia, Russian oil companies, and that the West will ultimately surrender to its blackmail. We should not send misleading signals to the Russian leadership and help the Kremlin to strengthen its illusions that Ukraine will stop its resistance and that the Western support for Ukraine and pressure on Russia are only provisional. This is not helping the cause of peace. Ukraine's sacrifices would be much heavier without the support from its partners. It is very encouraging that finally there is this prevailing understanding in Europe and beyond that the only road to restoring peace in Europe goes through the attrition of Russia's resolve to continue destroying Ukraine. And this can only be achieved by significantly upgrading the defensive potential of Ukraine and strengthening the resilience of its economy. Ukraine needs more modern weapons and more economic support from its partners. After the Ukrainian armed forces repelled the Russian invaders to the positions held before 24 February, Kyiv will sit down with Moscow for peace talks. But this is completely counterintuitive and against Europe's own interests to encourage Ukraine to do it before this is achieved. Any truce now with the Russian troops and tanks in Ukraine will only be used by the Kremlin as a breathing space to fortify its positions on the already occupied territories and prepare the ground for further escalation. This approach will not help to achieve peace, but only make the situation much worse for the whole Europe. Lesson number two, the Kremlin's ability to restore its potential to wage war has to be targeted much more effectively and with a greater sense of responsibility. This is, not, this is important not only for helping Ukraine to win, but for all countries in Europe to feel safe. Russia has proved to be irrational in its foreign policy choices and totally disrespectful of the laws of our civilization. But the Kremlin will not be able to disregard the laws of nature. If Russia is deprived of capacity to refuel its war machine, it will lose the ability to threaten its neighbors and other countries on our continent. However, 
Europe's current approach is still sending those mixed signals to the Kremlin. Since 24 February, countries of the European Union transferred to Russia more than 52 billion euros for fossil fuels. This is not about comparing this figure with only several hundred million allocated for humanitarian aid to alleviate the most acute humanitarian crisis in Europe that Russia has created. But this is to point out the most obvious inconsistency. Why to finance the revisionist power that is doing everything to undermine the European security and destroy the European project? Sanctions against Russia must be further strengthened and expanded. The world, and especially countries in Europe, have to stop buying Russian commodities. Lesson number three. We cannot allow any longer grey zones and security vacuum in Europe. They prove to be the most powerful incentives for the Russian revisionism and one of the main reasons of the current catastrophe. For both NATO and the EU, keeping Ukraine at bay proved to be a major strategic mistake. The most credible explanation of the Kremlin's decision to attack my country is that for some internal reasons they needed another easy victory and they expected Ukraine to be such an easy victory. Yes, Ukrainians proved the Kremlin to be very wrong. However, Russia didn't try a chance for an easy victory with any other country in Europe that would not be already in the EU or NATO. Ukraine being left outside of the major institutions of the European architecture to a very large extent because of fears of not provoking Russia, was perceived by the Kremlin as an invitation to the aggression. Finally, we understand what was the real provocation to Russia. It was a Ukraine that was left out in the cold. So when today we hear again ideas about some kind of new alternatives to Ukraine's fully-fledged membership in the EU or NATO, Maybe we have to revisit the history of Europe since the end of the World War II. The very project of the European Union was brought to life as a means of preventing war in Europe, not as a mechanism for distributing subsidies to our farmers. Both the EU and NATO need to accept Ukraine as soon as possible as their new member state. This is important for the EU and NATO themselves. This is needed for the sake of establishing the lasting peace in Europe. Lesson number four, after this war in Europe is over, our world cannot be the same again. European and Euro-Atlantic institutions failed to prevent this war. The UN Security Council, for some reason, still remains the top prize for our diplomatic services to compete for non-permanent seats there, but this body is not discharging its responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. After this war is over, we simply will not be able to return to the business as usual. Of course, it will be up to our people and the elected leaders of our societies to take decisions on how to reform the international security system, maybe even to rebuild it entirely, but no statement on the current situation will be complete and honest without this acknowledgement. We have to start thinking already now about an upgraded or even a completely new international security architecture. There are, of course, many other important lessons and conclusions that can be drawn already now, but it is impossible to elaborate on all of them in short remarks. However, it would be very wrong not to at least mention one more lesson. If we truly believe in democracy, we should trust more and follow our own people. We should be much quicker and display more leadership in reacting to their will especially when their will is expressed so clearly and so explicitly. We have to admit that since 24 February, most of us in the so-called elite stratum of society, politicians, diplomats, and even foreign policy and defense experts, we were seriously behind our people in responding to this most serious crisis. President Zelensky grasped the will of the Ukrainian people instantly. The nation has to stand up and fight. This is why he is applauded today as the world's bravest leader. People in all European countries and beyond know that Russia has nuclear weapons. But millions of them were instantly on the streets of all our major cities requesting to support Ukraine through all possible means. In the end, we all come to a common understanding on these matters. 
We are all proud of King Hokom and his Kongens Nai rather than of Minister President Quisling. We are all proud of Charles de Gaulle rather than of Pierre Laval. And we are all proud of Churchill's we shall fight on the beaches rather than of Chamberlain's peace for our time. But it looks like people in democratic societies do not need this long historical distance to decide. They possess this important quality to distinguish very fast between the right and wrong side of history, between the right and wrong courses of action. We should trust and follow our people. Ladies and gentlemen, I will conclude at this point and I would like to use this opportunity to thank all of you most sincerely for your important support of Ukraine at this decisive moment. Thank you.